Rational functions, such as f of x equals x squared minus 3 over x plus 2, often include asymptotes. The graph of this function does. In this video, I'll describe four steps that can be used to draw the graph of rational functions, including how to deal with asymptotes. Those four steps are to first identify what the asymptotes are. That comes first. After identifying the asymptotes, you'll find the first derivative, and that will give you information about where the function's graph is increasing and decreasing. Then comes the second derivative. The second derivative won't tell you where the graph is increasing or decreasing, but gives a lot of information about the graph's concavity. Once you've identified the asymptotes, intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing, and intervals of concavity, you have enough information to sketch the graph. I've described step four as sketching the graph based on the results of steps one, two, and three. We'll now perform those four steps to draw the graph of f of x equals x squared minus three over x plus two. There are three kinds of asymptotes that a rational function might have. Vertical, horizontal, and slant asymptotes. Slant asymptotes are sometimes known as oblique asymptotes. First, let's think about vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes occur when the denominator is zero. They occur at x values when the denominator is zero, but not the numerator. To find vertical asymptotes, you set the denominator equal to zero. And here, setting the denominator equal to zero gives a pretty simple equation, x plus two equals zero. And that means that x equals negative two is a potential vertical asymptote. I say potential because if you would substitute negative two into the numerator and you would get a zero in the numerator as well, that would indicate that x equals negative two is not a vertical asymptote. But here, substituting negative two into the numerator yields negative two squared four minus three, which is one, not zero. So x equals two is a vertical asymptote. A more detailed description of finding vertical asymptotes and horizontal and slant asymptotes um, are, is included in the description of this video. Horizontal asymptotes are based on the degree of the numerator and denominator. Again, rational functions are a ratio of polynomials, and horizontal asymptotes are based on the degree of those polynomials. And if the degree in the numerator is greater than the degree in the denominator, which is the case here, the degree in the numerator is two and the degree of the denominator is one, there are no horizontal asymptotes. So we can just state that there are not any horizontal asymptotes to deal with when graphing this function. Horizontal asymptotes do occur when the degrees in the numerator and denominator are equal or if the degree of the denominator is bigger, but that's not what we're dealing with here. Again, for more information about this, you can see the description in this, of this video. Slant asymptotes also are related to the degrees of the numerator and denominator. Slant asymptotes only occur in one specific situation where the degree of the numerator is exactly one larger than the degree of the denominator. And that's what we're dealing with here. We have a degree of two in the numerator and a degree of one in the denominator. There is a slant asymptote in the graph of this function. That slant asymptote can be found by taking the zero of the denominator, which we already found to be negative two, and dividing, using that, in a division. This slant asymptote occurs at y equals x squared minus three divided by x plus two, where you ignore the remainder of this division. I'm going to do this division with a by using synthetic division. The first step in synthetic division is to take the zero of the denominator, put it in a box, half of a box, and then I'm going to list the coefficients of the numerator. The coefficient of the numerator is one x to the second. Now there's not a linear term, there's not an x to the first in the numerator, so I'm going to express that as zero x to the first, and then minus three is the constant. The synthetic division process requires leaving basically an empty row, then drawing a line, horizontal line. And I've also drawn a vertical line here at the bottom, and this is going to be where the remainder is, which 
I will ignore when determining what the slant asymptote is. The synthetic division process requires bringing down the first coefficient from the numerator, which is a one in this case, and then as I go up to this second row, I'll take one times negative two, one times negative two has a product of negative two, and as I come down the column, I'll add zero plus negative two, which is negative two. Negative two times negative two is positive four, and these last two steps aren't important when identifying slant asymptotes because the remainder is not important, but this division, this division turns out to be one X minus two, the numbers in the bottom row here represent the coefficients of the quotient, one X minus two, and the remainder, which can be written as a fraction divided by the original denominator X plus two, is not important when it comes to identifying the slant asymptote. This slant asymptote is one X minus two. This slant asymptote has the equation y equals x minus 2. Again, the slant asymptote occurs when the degree of the numerator is exactly one bigger than the degree of the denominator, as was the case here, and you can find it by division, x squared minus 3 divided by x plus 2, ignoring the remainder. To do this division, I used synthetic division. You could also use polynomial long division. You would, you would find the same quotient, of course, y equals x minus 2. That's the slant asymptote. Step 2 is the first step that requires calculus. In, this, in the process of drawing this graph, we're going to find the first derivative. That's going to tell us all we need to know about where the function is increasing and decreasing. To find the derivative of a rational function like this, we're going to need the quotient rule. And the quotient rule states that the derivative of a fraction is the, the original denominator times derivative of the numerator, like the bottom times derivative of the top, minus the original numerator times the derivative of the denominator, all over the denominator squared. In the case of x squared minus 3 over x plus 2, then the derivative would be the denominator x plus 2 times the derivative of the numerator. Derivative of x squared minus 3 is 2x minus the numerator unchanged, x squared minus 3, times the derivative of the denominator. And the derivative of x plus 2 is just 1. It's going to be pretty easy to work with because multiplying by a factor of 1 won't change anything. To simplify this derivative, I'll distribute 2x and distribute the negative through the quantity of x squared minus 3. And that will yield 2x squared plus 4x minus x squared and then the last term is plus 3, because again, I'm distributing a negative to the term negative 3, which means that last term is plus 3. There is one pair of like terms to combine before calling this derivative simplified. The derivative of the function is x squared plus 4x plus 3. Now, the first derivative can be used to find what are known as critical numbers. And critical numbers are x values where the graph could possibly change from increasing to decreasing. Critical numbers occur where the first derivative is equal to 0 and where the first derivative doesn't exist. The first derivative is equal to 0 when, in the case of a fraction, the numerator equals 0. The only way a fraction can be 0 is if the numerator is 0, if you have 0 divided by a number. So let's set this numerator equal to 0, x squared plus 4x plus 3. A quadratic, in this case, is equal to 0. A lot of times, when you set a quadratic equal to 0, you'll need the quadratic formula. But this one factors pretty easily. x squared plus 4x plus 3 factors to x plus 3 times x plus 1. And setting each of those factors equal to 0 means x equals negative 3 and x equals negative 1. So those are two critical numbers of this function. There's an additional critical number where the denominator, where the first derivative doesn't exist. That would be where the denominator is equal to zero. We actually already set the denominator equal to zero when we found the vertical asymptote, and that was x equals negative two. This function has three critical numbers, x equals negative three, x equals negative one, and x equals negative two. Those are the only places where this graph could change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, the only values. 
We can also use those values to, to determine exactly where this function has intervals of increasing and decreasing. And I'll do that by making a number line. And this number line is going to represent the x values in the domain of this function. And on this number line, I'm going to place the critical numbers. I'll go from lowest to highest, of course. And these three critical numbers break apart the number line into four intervals. In each of these four intervals, the graph will either be increasing over the entire interval or decreasing over the entire interval. And what I'll do to figure out whether it is increasing or decreasing in each interval is I'll choose a value in the interval. For example, the first interval from negative infinity to negative 3 includes the value of negative 4. So I'll, I'll, I'll choose negative 4. I could pick negative 5 or negative 10 or any number between negative infinity and negative 3. Um, and when I substitute a negative 4 into the first derivative, if I get a positive value, that means the function is increasing not only at negative 4, but in at every x value in the interval from negative infinity to negative 3. It doesn't even matter what the actual value is. If it's negative, it's decreasing. If it's positive, it's increasing. Substituting a negative 4 into the first derivative, in this case, yields a positive number yields a positive number. If you put a negative 4 into the first derivative, you get a positive number. And that means that this function is increasing, again, not only at negative 4, but at every number between negative infinity and negative 3. Now I'm going to do a similar thing for each interval between negative 3 and negative 2. There, there are not any intervals, or there are not any integers, but I'll choose negative 2.5. And substituting a negative 2.5 into the first derivative yields a negative number, and that means that this function is decreasing between negative 3 and negative 2. After negative 2, between negative 2 and negative 1, I'll choose negative 1.5 as my test value. And f prime of negative 1.5 is, is negative again. So, so that means the graph is also decreasing from negative 2 to negative 1. How about from negative 1 to infinity? You can choose any value between negative 1 and infinity for this test value, but 0 is an easy number to work with. I'll pick 0, substituting a 0 again, not into the original function, but into the first derivative. gives a positive number. It, it would be positive 3 fourths, but it doesn't matter what it is, just that it's positive. That tells me that this function would be increasing from negative 1 to infinity. Now I'm going to summarize this information by saying that the function is increasing from negative infinity to negative 3. I'm going to use interval notation for this. this. These are not ordered pairs. This is me representing the interval, the open interval from negative infinity to negative 3. And it's also increasing from negative 1 to infinity. I found that the function was decreasing between negative 3 and negative 2 and decreasing again from negative 2 to negative 1. Now, I could not say that this is decreasing the whole way from negative 3 to negative 1, because remember, there's a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. There's a discontinuity in this graph. It's not decreasing the whole time. It's decreasing from negative 3 to negative 2. There's the discontinuity, which is a vertical asymptote. Then it's decreasing again from negative infinity or from negative 2 to negative 1. Extrema are high or low points in the graph. High points or low points. Extrema can occur at critical numbers where the derivative was equal to 0. So in this case, negative 3 and negative 1 are possible extreme values. Remember, x equals negative 2 was a critical number, but that's a vertical asymptote. That's not a possible max or a min. At a, a vertical asymptote is a discontinuity in the graph. There's, there's no point at x equals negative 2 at all. If you tried to evaluate f of negative 2, you would get an un, you would get undefined. You would be dividing by 0. So negative 3 and negative 1 are the only possible extreme values, possible places where there's a peak or a valley in the graph. Let's take a look at both of them. At x equals negative 3, before negative 3, the graph is increasing. And after negative 3, it's decreasing. It's going up, then it gets to negative 3, and then it starts to go down. So that means that negative 3 is a high point in the graph. It's a relative maximum value. It's not necessarily the highest point the graph ever gets to, 
but relative to the points around it, it's a peak. Relative max. I'll abbreviate relative maximum value as just MAX. And I'm writing an ordered pair here. This is not an interval, but this is there is a relative maximum value at the ordered pair, negative 3, comma, F of negative 3. If I put negative 3 back into the original function, I'll get a value of negative 6 for Y. F of negative 3 is negative 6. So at the point, negative 3, negative 6, there's a high point in the graph. There's a peak in the graph. Now let's check out x equals negative 1. Before x equals negative 1, the graph is going down. It gets to x equals negative 1, and then it goes up. That means x equals negative 1 is a relative minimum value. It's a low point in the graph. Again, it's not the lowest point necessarily that the graph ever gets to, but relative to the points around it, it's a minimum value. Again, I'll substitute a negative 1 for x in the original function. f of negative 1 is negative 2, so the point negative 1, negative 2 is a relative minimum value. Now that I've found all the information about where the graph is increasing and decreasing, I'll move on to step 3. There's more calculus in step three. I have to find the second derivative. The second derivative will give me all the information I need about the graph's concavity, not where it's increasing and decreasing, but where the graph is concave up and where it's concave down. To find the second derivative, I'll certainly need the first derivative, and again, I'll be applying the quotient rule. So here, the second derivative is x plus two squared. This is the denominator. And the derivative of the numerator, the derivative of x squared plus 4x plus 3, is 2x plus 4. Then there's a minus sign. And I'm going to copy down the original numerator. The numerator was x squared plus 4x plus 3. The derivative of the denominator requires the chain rule. This is x plus 2 squared. So I'll bring the 2 to the front, decrease the power down by 1, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. But the derivative of x plus 2 is just 1. So that will be pretty easy to work with. I'll have to simplify this. I'll have to do some simplifying here. Uh, the only simplifying that I'll uh, write from the line I have above to the line I have at the bottom is just the fact that multiplying by 1 doesn't change anything in the numerator. And in the denominator, I have x plus 2 squared to the second power. You multiply these exponents to get x plus 2 to the fourth power. Something that always is going to happen when you take the second derivative of a rational function is you'll end up with a quantity to the fourth in the numerator, and that same quantity will show up in both terms in the numerator. There's an x plus 2 to the first power in the numerator, and also an x plus 2 to the second power in the numerator. So what I can do is I can simplify these. There's four factors in the denominator, and what I'll do is I'll cancel out a factor in both terms in the numerator with one of these four factors. So this will go down to x plus 2 to the third. I can eliminate x plus 2 to the first and the x plus 2 to the second. Again, I'm, I'm eliminating one factor of this quantity from all terms in the numerator and denominator. So that's going to go down to one. So that leaves me with a situation that that's a little simpler. I have x plus 2 to the first times 2x plus 4 minus x squared plus 4x plus 3. I have some algebra to do here. The next step, I'm going to multiply x plus 2 times 2x plus 4. I'll distribute x times 2x and 4. And I'll distribute 2 times 2x plus 4. And I'll also distribute not only the negative times x squared plus 4x plus 3, but I'll also distribute the 2. It'll be like I'm distributing negative 2 times the quantity of x squared plus 4x plus 3. And all of these multiplications are going to yield 2x squared plus 4x plus 4x plus 8. This is the result of multiplying x plus 2 and 2x plus 4. And then distributing the negative 2 to the quantity of x squared plus 4x plus 3 yields negative 2x minus 8x minus 6. Realize that you're distributing the negative to all three terms here in addition to the 2. It's a lot of like terms here. I have 2x squared and minus 2x squared. Those are going to add up to 0. And how about plus 4x, plus 4x, and negative 8x? Those three terms also add up to 0. Actually, the only non-zero terms in the numerator are going to come from 8 and negative 6. 
whose sum is 2. The second derivative here is 2 over x squared minus 1 to the third power. Now I'm going to use this second derivative, 2 over x plus 2 to the third power, to find possible points of inflection and information about the graph's concavity. So possible points of inflection are places where the graph changes concavity. It's an actual point where, before the point, it's either concave up or concave down, then the curve gets to a certain point and then changes concavity after that. And points of inflection are the only places that points of inflection could occur are x values where the second derivative is equal to zero. In a rational function, the only way that a second derivative could equal zero is if the numerator would be equal to zero. And here the numerator is just a constant. There's not a variable in the numerator, so there are no possible points of inflection. I'm going to find when I draw the graph of this curve, there's not going to be any points where the graph changes inflection at that point. However, there are other x values where a graph could possibly change inflection. So an x value where before the x value, it's either concave up or concave down, and then after the x value to its right, the inflection is different, the concavity is different. And those are places where the second derivative doesn't exist, aka in the case of a rational function where the denominator is equal to zero. And again, we've already set this denominator equal to zero when we found the vertical asymptotes. So x equals negative two, is not a possible point of inflection. It's a vertical asymptote. It's a discontinuity in the graph. It's not a point on the graph at all, but it is an x value where the graph could change concavity to the left and right. So x equals negative two is an x value where the graph could change inflection. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that along with the possible points of inflection if, they were, if there were any to find intervals of concavity. It's very similar to the process I used when I found the intervals where the function was increasing and decreasing. I'm going to make a number line with all of the possible points of inflection and x values where the, the graph could change concavity on the, on the number line. There's only one in this case. It's negative 2. And I'm going to substitute numbers in the interval, in each of the two intervals, into the second derivative. And this time, if substituting a value in an interval in the second derivative yields a positive number, that means the curve is concave up through that entire interval. And if it's negative, that means the graph is concave down through that entire interval. A number between negative infinity and negative 2, like negative 3, has a second derivative which is negative. And that means that this function is going to be concave down throughout the entire interval from negative infinity to negative 2. It'll be concave down over that entire interval. How about between negative 2 and infinity? I'll choose 0 as my test value. That's a number between negative 2 and infinity. And if I find in the second derivative that this is positive, which I do, if you substitute a 0 into the second derivative, 2 over 0 plus 2 to the third power is positive. Doesn't matter what it is, just that it's positive you can say that the graph of the function is concave up in the entire interval from negative 2 to infinity. Let's summarize. This is, this is concave up from negative 2 to infinity. This curve will be concave down from negative infinity to negative 2. And there are no points of inflection. There are not any actual places where uh, I'm going to get to a point and change inflection. The graph does change concavity at x equals negative 2, but that's not a point, that's a vertical asymptote. At this point, I have enough information to sketch the curve. Let's do that now. The first three steps in this process have provided me with a lot of information. I know there's vertical asymptotes at x equals negative 2 and a slant asymptote at y equals x minus 2. I know the intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing relative extrema, and all the information I need to know about the graph's concavity. On a coordinate plane, I'm going to first express the vertical asymptotes as dotted lines. There's one vertical asymptote, x equals negative 2. So what I'll do is, even though this dotted line isn't technically part of the graph, I'm going to use it to help me sketch the graph. 
I'll, I'll use a dotted line as the vertical asymptote, x equals negative 2. Slant asymptote, y equals x minus 2. I'll also represent this with a dotted line. y equals x minus 2 is a straight line. The y-intercept is negative 2. And from that negative 2, the slope is 1. y equals x minus 2 has a slope of 1. So from the point of negative 2, I'll rise 1 and run 1, rise 1, go over to the right 1. Um, to the right and to the left uh, for a few points and then join those points with with a straight line and again I'm making this a dotted line this is not actually part of the graph but it's an asymptote it forms a boundary for the curve the curve will get closer and closer to this slant asymptote as it goes off to the left and as it goes off to the right Now, I, had, I'm go, I have some points to plot here. I have a relative maximum value, a relative minimum value. I'm going to plot that. If there were any points of inflection, I would plot those as well. In this case, there's not. There's a relative maximum value at negative 3, negative 6. So I'll go ahead and, and plot a point at negative 3, negative 6, and a relative minimum value at negative 1, negative 2. I'll plot a point right there. There's no points of inflection to plot. If you wanted to, if you wanted to make your graph more accurate, you could choose some other points to plot. You could plot some x-intercepts, or some y, the y-intercept if you would like. You could pick a point to the left and right of each of the relative max and min values. Uh, in this case, to just sketch the general shape of this curve, I'm not going to plot any additional points. And actually, I can use the, the information that I have found to draw a fairly accurate graph. The first relative extreme value that I plotted was the max at negative 3, negative 6. So let's think about the interval from negative 3 to negative, uh, from negative infinity to negative 3. Let's think about the interval from negative 3, negative infinity to negative 3. From negative infinity to negative 3, I know that this curve is increasing and this curve is concave down. It's actually concave down the whole way to negative 2, but it's, it's definitely concave down from negative infinity to negative 3. So from negative infinity to negative 3, I'm going to draw a curve that is increasing and concave down. Look above the coordinate plane. A curve that is increasing and concave down looks like this. This is increasing concave down. This point has to be, or this curve has to be getting closer and closer to the slant asymptote at y equals x minus 2 as it moves off to the left. And this curve has to end at the point negative 3, negative 6. So drawing a curve that is increasing concave down, that's getting closer and closer to that slant asymptote as it moves off to the left, and ends at the point negative 3, negative 6, looks generally like what I've drawn on the screen here. Now, from negative 3 to negative 2, from negative 3 to negative 2, it's decreasing from negative 3 to negative 2. Based on my analysis of the first derivative, I found that it was decreasing from negative 3 to negative 2. And it's concave down. It's still concave down until it gets to this vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. A curve that is decreasing and concave down from left to right looks like this. Look above the coordinate plane. Decreasing concave down looks like that. So I'm going to draw a curve that has that shape. And as it gets close to negative 2, that's a vertical asymptote, so it'll be getting closer and closer to that vertical line, but never touching it. So I have a curve. It's not parabolic in shape. This is not. This wouldn't be like part of a par parabola. Um, it's extending off to the left, getting closer and closer to the vertical asymptote at y equals x minus 2. And from negative 3 to negative 2, it's decreasing concave down, getting closer and closer to the vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. All right, the next little interval I have is from negative 2 to negative 1. And from negative 2 to negative 1, graph's decreasing again. It's also, based on the result of the second derivative, it's concave up from negative 2 to infinity. It's going to be concave up for the um, rest of the graph. A graph that's decreasing and concave up looks like this. So I'm going to draw a curve that ends at the point negative 1, negative 2. It's getting closer and closer to the vertical asymptote, but never touches it. Decreasing concave up, ending at negative 1, negative 2. 
and then from negative 2 to infinity, uh, or from negative 1 to infinity, rather, from negative 1 to infinity, I'm increasing and still concave up, increasing, concave up, getting closer and closer to the slant asymptote, but never touching it. Looks like this. So on the screen, based on the result of the first derivative, second derivative, my finding of the asymptotes, the graph of y equals f of x equals x squared minus 3 over x plus 2 has this general shape.